So, welcome to our workshop, PKI at the Edge, what to do when you have to do it by hand. Well, we'll actually try and take you through the uh, APIs and scripting tools that are available for situations where you can't quite uh, make use of the tool chain. So, basically we're looking at three sessions. The first covers the basics of key pair generation and certification requests. The second covering certificate and CRL generation. And then the third, which we've called keeping it simple, looks at the use of Kotlin DSL or a domain specific language using the BC Kotlin API to write scripts for performing most of the Java tasks that we'll look at in the first two sessions. While it doesn't mention any of the overview uh, here, the, the third section will also look a bit at private key storage. When we said uh, simple with Kotlin, it's true, but as it turned out, it was so simple that we ended up with a few slides short, and uh, so we added some extra material. After that, we'll just go through a bit of a summary to make sure everyone knows uh, what it was that we were supposed to be talking about. So, it may seem a little bit strange to be doing something like this when there is an application like EJBCA available. Um, and it's true, enterprise PKI solutions are generally better handled using tools like EJBCA because, you know, you need to be able to manage and deal with large numbers of certificates. There are often, though, a small number of things, often legacy servers, for example, that don't quite fit a model that you might be building into your overall PKI architecture. And these may need a bespoke solution. Knowing how all this stuff works has other benefits as well. It helps you to know how certification requests and certificates are really constructed. What standards they rely on and a bit about how to analyse them can also help take the mystery out. If you're dealing with a compatibility issue or uh, trying to find, as I said, a bespoke solution. Being able to do this, of course, that means that you have to have some idea of what's actually available. And what we're hoping to do in this workshop is manage to do that for you. So, as the workshop title has implied, doing this is really about doing things by hand. And so, in this workshop, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the really basic stuff at the beginning. So, security levels for public-private keys. What does it mean to even just say you want to generate a key of a particular size? We're also going to deal with certificate request generation using Bouncy Castle and how certificate request formats can vary and why. We'll be looking at certificate generation using EJBCA as well, so that you can actually get some sort of a relationship between what happens when you're doing it by hand versus what happens when you're using an enterprise solution. We'll look at basic certificate extensions. These are often quite meaningful and can also be the source of compatibility issues. Then, of course, we'll be looking at the use of the Kotlin scripting API for all of the above. Output and encryption of private keys. And uh, just a quick look at uh, the use of key stores for FIPS and non-FIPS, because a lot of people find that a bit of a stumbling point as well. When we finished, all things being equal, you should be able to recognise what key strengths you need for the security level you're trying to deal with. You should be able to determine what type of certification request is appropriate for the key pair you have you should be able to create certificate certification requests and certificates using the Bouncy Castle APIs with either Java or Kotlin, if you have people that are more comfortable with scripts and actual programming languages. And you should be able to save and encrypt private keys using the Bouncy Castle APIs for Java and Kotlin as well. They're particularly important in server environments. And finally, yeah, you'll be able to understand key stores and understand the limitations in certified environments. Now, I'm hoping you would have already been able to set this up yourself, although if you're someone doing this online later, uh, which obviously these videos will be made available online, if you're not set up to run Java and Kotlin, I'd pause here, get set up, and then come back and hit play again. We're not going to ask you to do tasks while um, presenting the slides. But we are providing exercises and handouts to go with the material being presented. You can look at the slides as trying to paint a picture 
with a broad brush to give you an understand of where and un give you an idea of where everything actually is at. The handouts will serve to provide finer detail and then the exercises will give you a way of cementing the knowledge through experience. Lastly, by way of introduction, here are the two people who will be taking you through the material. Bastian is an experienced solution architect at PrimeKey. David, that's me, who's talking now, is one of the founders and long-term developer of the Bouncy Castle project. Between us, there is more than enough experience with PKI, EJBCA and Bouncy Castle to go around, so you can be assured that we've got you well covered. I'll be handing over to Bastian for the second session and then coming back for the third. So, let's begin section, session one. Key pair generation and certification requests using the Bouncy Castle APIs. Okay, so firstly, I'm just going to go quickly through the basic concepts to make sure everyone's clear. Key generation for public key algorithms usually involves generation of a public key which can be distributed in a private key. This isn't actually always true with post quantum algorithms, but uh, that's outside of what we're talking about now. Um, together these things are referred to as a key pair. These keys by themselves have no provenance or association, which is to say that you can't really look at a private and public key and go, okay, well, that represents this organisation or this individual. And what we need is some way of actually building this association between an individual or organisation and the public key that they're using, that, that is basically purporting to represent them. This is done by certification. So the X509 certificate, which we all know and love is basically an example of that. Now often we want to get another party to attest to an association, so somebody who's got more authority than we have, and we do this by giving them a certification request. Now ideally a good certification request will allow us to keep the things that we want private private and at the same time testify that the thing that we want to make public that claims to represent us um, has been really us. This term is actually called proof of possession. And it's proof of possession, mechanisms for proof of possession that are provided to certification authorities are primarily the means by which certification requests are actually usable. It's the key concept that we're actually dealing with when we're looking at a certification request, what proof of possession mechanism you actually need to use. So, why do we talk about different versions of POP? Well, elliptic curve, EC, RSA, DSA and Diffie-Hellman are all examples of current public key algorithms that are in use. But, some algorithms, like RSA, can be used for signing an encryption. Uh, EC can be used for signing a key agreement. And sometimes algorithms are specifically single purpose. Uh, Diffie-Hellman, uh, which is for key agreement only, and DSA, which is for signing, are both examples of that. So, you can actually demonstrate uh, proof of possession, though, or POP, in all these cases, even where the restrictions do apply to the operations that you can do. I should point out, though, of course, that even where keys can potentially be used for multiple things, you should really only apply them to one operation if you're using them uh, cryptographically. Uh, RSA is a special case, uh, particularly in the case of RSA. Uh, that said, uh, you can actually use a RSA encryption key to sign a certification request. That's regarded as an acceptable thing to do, but only on the basis that you don't do it more than once, and that, that is the only signature you generate. So generating key pairs, there's a few things you need to think about. There's three considerations. Um, you need qu good quality entropy. You need to think about what key size you're going to use. And then, of course, there's the correctness of the actual generating implementation. Now, entropy refers to the source of randomness we're using. Cryptographic randomness is very different from numerical randomness. Um, 
if you're just dealing with a numerical random number generator, what you want is something that will, you know, kind of produce a statistically flat range of random numbers. Uh, the problem, of course, with the numerical random number generator is if you identify the formula that's in use, then it's actually possible to predict what numbers will be generated a bit later, and also what numbers came before. Uh, neither of these things are very useful in uh, cryptography from a security point of view. What you're really looking for in entropy is noise. Unpredictable, awful, awful, wonderful in this context, noise. Algebra will not help. Okay, so for key sizes, uh, the main thing to remember, of course, is that uh, when you're talking about security strength uh, for public-private keys, it's generally radically different to uh, the actual security strength you've got in bits. While a symmetric algorithm like AS, for example, 128-bit AS key should be 128 bits secure. Uh, with Diffie-Hellman and RSA or elliptic curve, the numbers vary. Uh, RSA, of course, you can see 3072 bits is 128 bits secure. Uh, EC, on the other hand, is uh, 256 bits. I'll actually give you the same. Uh, elliptic curve can become very useful at this level because, uh, as you can see, once you get to 256 bits of security, an RSA or Diffie-Hellman key is actually 15,360 bits, which can be rather large. Uh, whereas elliptic curve is still holding in there at 512 plus bits. So P521, for example, uh, is comfortable with uh, being used in 256 bits of security type applications. And the next thing that you need to consider about what's going on when you're generating a key pair is the correctness of the actual implementation. In the case of Bouncer Castle, we follow the FIPS guidelines for actually doing these things. Um, and where this is important is particularly in relation to generating prime numbers, which uh, a lot of algorithms actually use. You need to make sure that the prime numbers you're generating are real primes, which means that you want them to be passing a, a recommended number of tests to provide a level of certainty that actually reflects the algorithm you're trying to implement. Generally, the standards for doing all this are actually documented in FIPS Pub 186-4 in the uh, appendices. So this is publicly available information. I certainly encourage you to check it if you're trying to validate uh, one of your prime number generators. Uh, this is the other thing though to consider. Prime number generation, of course, is quite slow. Uh, for this reason, you'll actually find that, say, elliptic curve generation, uh, sorry, elliptic key generation, is generally much faster than RSA, since all you need to do is generate a number and find a point on the curve. Um, doing things like generating parameters for Diffie-Hellman too, yes, you don't want to be doing that very often. All right, so what I'm going to do now is I'll just look quickly over the um, classes and Java support for doing things like key pair generation um, and certification requests. So I'll talk a bit about the protocols that are involved in certification requests as well. Uh, but in the case of key pair generation, in the JCA it's really quite straightforward. There is the key pair generator class. Now, there are examples of how using these in the actual handouts, but what you'll find is that, um, especially now with Java 11, there are specific um, parameter classes to actually specify what curves or RSA key sizes uh, you actually want. Um, setting up an RSA key, you just use an RSA key gem parameter spec, you pass that to the init method, and then you just call generate key pair. Uh, for an elliptic curve key, you can use the EC gen parameter spec. And yeah, as I said, with Java 11, things have been a bit more formalized, so they now have the named parameter spec, which a lot of people have started supporting. Uh, that's also the only one that you can actually use if you're dealing with Edwards curves. Just something to keep in mind as well. So, PKCS10 is the original certification request format. Uh, originally it was specified as part of the PKCS standards, which was the public key cryptography standards that were published by the RSA company and came out of RSA Labs. 
Uh, it's now described in RFC 2986 as uh, the PKCS standards were basically handed over to the IETF. It has its own MIME type, and the MIME types are important because often what will happen is you'll just get one of these things in a blob and you won't know what's going on. If you recognize the MIME type, that'll certainly help. In this case, the MIME type you're looking for is application PKCS 10. Now, the catch with PKCS 10, because it was largely designed for the RSA algorithm, is that you ha really need an algorithm that can be used for signing to generate one of these. Uh, and as I uh, hinted at before, its generation of a PKCS 10 certification request is the only exception allowed to the rule that an RSA encryption key cannot be used for signing. It's important to keep that in mind. Uh, as I said, just because you can actually use an algorithm for signing uh, and encryption doesn't necessarily mean it's a good idea to do that with the same key. Now, um, the fact that you can actually use the uh, RSA algorithm to sign a certification request means that with either encryption or um, signing keys, you can actually generate a certification request that's specific to the key and then the uh, Certifying authority can actually verify that message that you've sent. So in Bouncy Castle, a PKCS 10 certification request is represented by a class called PKCS 10 certification request, which has a an extension uh, which actually provides for support of um, JCA based keys, and there's a similar one if you're trying to use the Bouncy Castle Lightweight API. Uh, you'll find this package in the BCPKIX jar, which is uh, one of the ancillary jars for the Bouncy Castle APIs to go with the provider. Now, I'll just briefly digress to explain why we do it like this. The, the reason for um, putting things like uh, certification requests and various other things, the mechanisms for those in a different jar, is that provider jars have to be signed by... Uh, a JC certification certificate, and in the case of a, um, a FIPS certified API, uh, you also have to go through a FIPS modification process if you want to change the code at all. Uh, for this reason, we actually try and avoid putting anything in the provider jar that doesn't have to be there. So I guess the first part about this message is that it's not in the provider jar, it's in BCP kicks. And the second thing is if you find an issue, you can actually fix it yourself if you need to in a hurry. Because the BCP kicks jar itself does not need to be signed for it to be able to work. Anyway, that aside, you'll find the uh, certification request for PKCS 10 under the package org.bouncycastle.pkcs along with a couple of other PKCS based classes. The JCA Builder class is JCA PKCS 10 Certification Request Builder, and that will allow you to pass JCA type objects, so JCA public, the regular public key and everything, uh, to actually create the certification request. And then there's a JCA Container class, which you can create, say you were given a, um, a my message, as I said before, you've got a base64 encoded blob, you convert that into a byte array, you can then pass it to a JCA PKCS 10 certification request, and, and that will allow you to recover, say, the public key uh, in a JCA-friendly form, and also to actually verify it in a JCA-friendly manner. Building one of these requires a, a uh, implementation of a content signer based on the private keys, public keys being used in the request. There will be more details on these kind of things in the actual handout, but the essential thing to understand about a content signer is it's just something that produces a uh, signature based on a uh, input stream that's provided to it. Um, it also has an algorithm identifier associated with it, which makes it very sort of ASM1 friendly. And PKCS10, as you'd expect, is a uh, uh, class that actually represents an ASM1 encoded blob. You can find the actual uh, grammar for the ASM1 in the uh, RFC. PKCS 10 generation also allows for this, requesting that CA add particular extensions to a certificate. So if you wanted to do something like, for example, add an email address using a subject alternative name extension, 
you can actually incorporate that into a PKCS10 uh, certification request and pass it on to the CA. And if the CA is amicable to the idea, they will insert that for you as well as part of the overall authorization certification process. Now, CRMF is a, is a newer standard, the PKCS10. It's described in RFC 4211. Usually you'll find CRMF messages being used in conjunction with Certificate Management Protocol, uh, which is described in RFC 4210. The, um, this is the reason why the MIME type that's actually associated with the CRMF message is in fact application PKIC CMP. It's very unusual to see one of these on its own. You'll usually, as I said, find one wrapped in a CMP message. The nice thing about CRMF, apart from its overall flexibility compared to PKCS10, is that it does allow for a variety of um, proof of possession mechanisms. So you can create uh, quite sensible CRMF messages for um, requesting a certificate that's going to contain a Diffie-Hellman key, for example, or a key that can only be used for encryption. There's four methods of uh, proof of possession defined. Uh, one which is called RA verified, which is kind of like a uh, it's been verified, please accept it. Uh, then there's also signing key, key incitement, and key agreement. And these all provide for proof of possession mechanisms which uh, allow you to actually find some way of determining that only the person that actually holds the private key for the pri public key that the certificate will be issued for will actually be able to um, make use of the certificate when it comes out. For a signing key, obviously, you can just actually verify a signature so the CA can tell automatically that the certification request is um, acceptable. With key enciphement and key agreement, though, you have to be a little bit sneakier and what the uh, CA will actually do then, it will send the certificate back to you as, as an encrypted blob. Uh, you then have to work out how to decrypt it. Uh, and so the assumption being that once you've decrypted it, and if you've actually got possession of the certificate, then clearly you're the person that's meant to have it. Since otherwise, uh, you would not have been able to decrypt it, since you wouldn't have had the private key. Okay, so from the Bouncy Castle point of view, um, the CRMF uh, classes appear in the BC PCX jar as well, like the PKCS10 one. Uh, in this case, under the package org.bouncycastle.cert.crmf. Uh, there's a JCA builder class, which is the JCA certificate request message builder, which serves a similar role as the JCA equivalent does in uh, PKCS10. And then there's a JCA container class, which is the JCA certificate request message. Now, when you build one of these, of course, you've got to actually choose a method of uh, proof of possession because unlike PKCS10, it's not automatically assumed to be signing. And the builder also allows for the inclusion of certificate extensions in a similar way to what you actually find with PKCS10 as well. Now, as I mentioned uh, too, uh, CRMF uh, in itself does not actually, is not actually presented as, a, as an all-inclusive message format. You actually need to usually wrap one of these inside a um, a CMP message, and uh, the CMP classes, uh, which are under org .bouncercastle .cert .cmp, uh there's either the general PKO message or there's a variation of it which is protected called the protected PKO message, and these are normally used as the container classes to actually uh, send a um, CRMF request to a CA for processing and to allow them to actually authorize the certificate you want. Uh, there's a bit more information on this in the actual handout. So that brings us to the end of the first session. Uh, I'll be handing over to uh, Bastian now for session two and uh, I'll be on again for session three. Uh, what I recommend doing now is having a look at the handouts and then uh, spending the next 10 minutes or so actually going through and trying to do some of the exercises. 
There are more exercises there than you could probably complete in the time available, but just try and do a few to make sure it's kind of sunk in. Uh, the rest you can do in your own time when you're feeling inspired. Uh, thanks again for listening, and uh, talk again soon. See ya. In the second part of the workshop, we are going to look at how to generate certificates as well as certificate revocation lists using both Bouncy Castle as well as uh, EGA DCA. Like David mentioned in session one, certificates are used to associate an identity with a public key. Um, so for example, if we're talking about certificates for websites on the internet, the identity would be the DNS name that you put into the address bar in the browser when you connect to that website. So all certificates contain this identity, whatever it is, um, as well as the corresponding public key. And that whole thing is then signed by the private key of an entity called a certificate authority. Okay, so that means you can't change anything in the certificate after it has been signed because that would break the signature and that would be detected by anyone who tries to validate the certificate. Certificate comes in three kinds depending on who owns the public key. So you have certificates that are signed with the same not the same, but the private key corresponding to the public key uh, appearing in the certificate. And those are called trust anchors or self-signed certificates. And then you have intermediate CA certificates, which are certificates with a public key belonging to a certificate authority. And they are typically signed by another intermediate CA or by a trust anchor. And then you have certificates that are issued to people like you and me, um, which are identity certificates. These certificates, they form what we call certificates paths. So if you want to validate a certificate, you start by validating the signature in the identity certificate using the public key found typically in the uh, intermediate CA certificate and then you validate the intermediate CA certificate and you go on like that until you arrive at the trust anchor which is something that uh, you have on your computer in a file called a trust store and those trust anchors are trusted you know by default um, and they are typically vetted uh, by the manufacturer of you know, whatever product you're using. So if you're using a Windows computer, a Microsoft has a root store program that uh, is vetting um, a bunch of CAs uh, before they're put into the trust store of your Microsoft Windows uh, workstation. Um, so that's uh, what we call a certificate path. Uh, now let's see what comes next. So at some point you may need to revoke a certificate, um, for example, because the private key corresponding to the public key in the certificate was uh, compromised. Um, you had it on a USB stick and someone stole the USB stick, you know, whatever it might be. Um, so there are two mechanisms for revocation, at least if we're with talking about X509 PPIs. Um, the first one is called certificate revocation lists. And that's essentially a list of certificates that are revoked. So each certificate has a serial number. Uh, which together with the name of the certificate authority that issued the certificate um, uniquely identifies a specific certificate. So you will have 
the, the serial will be a, a list of serial numbers, essentially, um, for a specific issue. Um, the second method is um, a protocol called Online Certificate Status Protocol, or OCSP. And when you use OCSP, you send a request um, to um, an OCSP responder and you ask the OCS responder if the certificate with this specific serial number issued by the specific certificate authority is revoked and then you get a response back uh, which is signed of course um, so no one can tamper with the response and there is a bunch of standards for this so you have OCSP in RFC 6960 I think um, yes, no, no, right. Um, and then you have certificates and serial profiles, which is described in RFC 5280. Um, both certificates and certificate revocation lists come in three different formats. So, or versions. So version one is only used for trust anchors. Um, version 2 is not being used anymore and then you have version 3 which is typically used for end entities so I described the certificate as something that contains an identity and a public key belonging to that identity and that thing is then signed by a certificate authority and the signature is also in the certificate. Um, in practice you have a few more things. So you have the subject which is basically like the identity, right? It's the name of the uh, owner of the public key. Um, and then you have the issuer, which is the name of the certificate authority that issued the certificate. Um, and then you have the serial number, which we have discussed already. Um, it's a unique number that I uniquely identifies a specific certificate for a particular issue. Um, so that's something we use, for example, um, uh, during revocation, as we discussed before. Um, and then you also have a validity period. So that's a big upgrade from just using public keys um, because now we can actually specify a time period um, for which the certificate is valid or for which the public key in the certificate is valid. Um, so the validity period consists of two dates, a not before date and a not after date. So if your current clock is before the not before date, then the certificate is not yet valid. And if the clock is after the not after date, then the certificate has, has expired. And in both of those cases, you can't trust the public key. Um, and then the big difference between the version one and the version three formats is that now in version three, you can also use something called certificate extensions uh, which allows you to add um, additional data to the certificate. Extensions can appear in both certificates as well as certificate revocation lists. Um, but as I mentioned, they don't appear in version 1 certificates because extensions weren't invented back then. Um, they allow additional attributes to be associated with the certificate. For example, um, who issued the certificate, um, uh, under what policy was the certificate issued, um, what can the public key in the certificate be used for, um, and so on. Um, each certificate extension can be marked as critical um, and that means that anyone who receives a copy of your certificate 
and tries to parse it has to understand uh, how to parse that particular extension or abort. So make sure that if you make an extension critical um, that um, this is an extension that's supported by uh, all clients receiving a copy of your snippet. So some common extensions you will find in your certificates are the basic constraints extension, the key usage extension, and the authority and subject key identifier. Um, so the basic constraints extension is one of the few extensions that's gonna be marked as critical. And that is because it specifies whether the certificate is a CA certificate. So whether you can use the, um, the public key to verify other certificates. Um, and then you have the key usage extension, which is specifying how the public key is allowed to be used. So for example, if you can use it for signature verification or encryption, or maybe both, although um, it's not recommended, but that's something you can specify with the key usage extension. Uh, one thing to note is that if you have a trust anchor using version three, then you must put both the basic constraints extension and the key usage extension in the certificate that's specified in RFC 5280. So if you're creating your own certificates and they're using the version three formats and you are creating a certificate for a trust anchor, make sure that you put those two extensions in there. Then you have uh, the authority key identifier, which is containing a hash of the issuer's public key. And in a similar fashion, the subject key identifier contains a hash of the public key that you can find in the certificate itself. So now let's look at how to generate certificates using Bouncy Console. So in the BCP KIX uh, jar file in the org.bouncyconsole.cert package, you'll find two builder classes, one for the version one certificate format and one for the version three certificate format. Um, so a builder class in Java is a class which is used to build objects. Um, and apart from that, you also need a content signer, uh, which is loaded with the private key of the certificate authority that's gonna sign your certificate. And out comes a X509 certificate class, uh, which you can parse using the X509 certificate holder that you're also gonna find in, in Bouncy Console. So to summarize, you pick uh, the certificate format uh, you want, version one or version three, uh, most likely version three, um, that will always work. Uh, if you're creating a trust anchor, you can pick version one. Uh, might be a bit easier, but hey, um, we shouldn't make it too easy. Um, so say version three, um, you create your content signer and you load it with the private key of the certificate authority. Um, and then you basically call the build method on the certificate builder and dependency inject your content signer and out comes your certificate. So for Serial generation, it's very similar. Um, you have a builder class, uh, you have a content signer, and you can parse the Serial using um, a container class, um, in this case called X59 Serial holder. Um, one thing to note here is that the key that you load into the content signer um, is 
most likely going to be the key of the of the CA that issues the SRL, but you can have the SRL being issued by uh, a dedicated SRL issuer, so it doesn't have to be the same key uh, used for uh, used by the CA. Uh, if you're using EJBCA, uh, it's always going to be the assigned key of the CA, but if you're using Bounce Castle, you can choose another key. So when you issue certificates in practice from a certificate authority that lives somewhere on the internet, um, you're going to use a certificate issuance protocol. Um, and there are a couple of different protocols depending on what kind of certificate you want to issue. Uh, so in the slide here, we have listed a few uh, options. Um, ACME, Automatic Certificate Management Environment, specified in RFC 8555, most commonly known as the protocol which is used by Let's Encrypt. Um, CMP, Certificate Management Protocol, RFC 4210, uh, which is used in mobile networks, for example. And then you have EST, Enrollment of a Secure Transport, which is replacing SCEP, which is Simple Certificate Enrollment Protocol. Both of those protocols are uh, designed by Cisco and used uh, by network equipment um, to get client certificates usually. Uh, all these protocols do support PKCS10, uh, which if you don't remember is the certificate um, signing request format that David was talking about. Uh, but CMP also supports the other format for certificate signing requests called CRMF. Uh, usually a CA supports one or more uh, of these protocols. If you use EJBCA, um, you can use all of these protocols, at least in the Enterprise Edition, and Bouncer Castle contains uh, a bunch of functionality and APIs for you to interface with the CA that's using one of these protocols. Let's look at how to put our skills to use by creating a certificate using EGBCA. First, let's look at EGBCA's REST API. Currently, the EGBCA REST API is only available in EGBCA Enterprise. Um, however, for those of you who do not have a commercial support contract, there is an option to start a trial in AWS. And so this will allow you to get access to all the enterprise features and get familiar with EGBCA Enterprise uh, for free. So to issue a certificate using EGBCA's REST API, uh, assuming Java is being used in this case, there are essentially four steps that you would have to perform. The first thing would be to create a CSR in the PCS10 format using Bouncy Castle. Um, and David has already explained to you how to do this. So that should be pretty straightforward. Um, secondly, you have to put this CSR um, along with some EGBCA specific parameters into a hash map. Um, the parameters that you have to specify are the name of the certificate profile in EGBCA, the name of the end entity profile, um, the name of the end entity that will be created in EGBCA, the password of the end entity, and optionally a Boolean parameter which specifies whether you want to fetch the whole certificate chain or not. Then step number three would be to serialize this um, hash map into a JSON uh, string um, using something like Google's uh, JSON package. And then finally, you can send this JSON string over an HTTPS connection to EGBCA 
um, using, for example, Apache's HTTP clients. Secondly, let's take a look at the certificate management protocol, uh, or CMP for short. Key pair generation will be exactly the same as in the previous example when we were using the REST API. However, construction of the CSR will be a little bit different since we're using CRMF instead of the CS10. The first step uh, will be to use Bouncy Castle to create a data structure called a certificate request message um, as explained by David in previous slides. We'll then wrap this certificate request message inside a protected PKI message. Uh, and this protected PKI message is signed with a secret, which is shared between EGBCA and um, the client. This will protect the message from tampering during transit and allow EGBCA to verify the sender. Uh, once you have created the protected PKI message, you can simply make an HTTP post and send it as a byte array over to EGBCA. The nice thing about CMP is that messages are often exchanged over a plain HTTP and a tool such as Wireshark has good built-in support for it. So you can use a packet capture to see the messages being sent back and forth and to inspect uh, in Wireshark um, and see what those messages contain. So now it's time for you to uh, look at the handouts. Uh, we have a few examples there, how to do certificate generation uh, as well as serial generation. Uh, we have a couple of examples how to create certificate sign requests and send them off to EGABCA. Um, so yeah, um, have fun. Again, it's probably too much to complete um, right now, but at least you can take a look get a feeling for how it works and if you have some time after the workshop you can uh, take a look at the remaining exercises. So this last bit uh, in, in some ways it's going to be revision as well but what we're basically going to be doing primarily is looking at um, the BC Kotlin API and also just as I said, a bit of extra stuff on uh, private key encryption, as in it's a fine thing to have a certificate and everything and be able to generate a certification request, but you probably want to do something with your private key while all of that's going on. So what happened with the Kotlin API was that we were approached by a few users who were basically having to distribute a couple of FIPS APIs, uh, an additional FIPS API, the OpenSSL one, uh, with the uh, Bouncy Castle uh, Java one. Uh, and the reason they were doing this was that uh, they needed to use some sort of scripting language for their sysadmins and everything. And only OpenSSL really fitted the bill. And the question was, could we actually come up with something which would allow people to, who, who weren't developers, but would be easy enough for them to explain to them to allow them to actually construct certificates and certification requests uh, so we had a bit of a think, and uh, after a couple of false starts, uh, we ended up trying to use do something in Kotlin because it has this sort of DSL um, capability, which makes it very easy to actually create sort of mini languages and provide a, a you know, by a non-programmer's point of view, a very friendly syntax. But it's still type safe and uh, you have additional features that you can actually make use of as well because it is fundamentally a programming language. It's more than a text file and it's it's even in some ways more than what you'd say a, a simple scripting language is. It has all the flexibility that you associate with a programming language. 
So the reality was it actually worked, which was the cause of much rejoicing. Uh, the distribution is available from uh, our GitHub repository. So HTTPS, uh, github.com, bcgit, bc-kotlin. Uh, the API has been extended to the point where it uh, supports the generation of key pairs, encryption, private keys, the generation of certificates and certification requests. The module name is actually kcrypto. Uh, there was some suggestion about calling it Bouncy Castle, spelled with a K, but we just never quite got there. So by now, uh, hopefully you've had a go at uh, some of the exercises in uh, Section 1. So you would have actually created a few key pairs uh, using the JCA already. Um, so you would recognise that uh, what you're looking at now on the screen is completely different to what you actually saw with the JCA. Uh, this really doesn't look like you're writing a program. Uh, at best, it looks like you're defining a variable. Uh, and so the, the style that you have with uh, the Kotlin API is clearly very declarative. Uh, we found that uh, for non-programming types, um, they, they actually feel a lot more comfortable uh, writing and understanding this, uh, uh, which is good. It's good. Now, a couple of other things to point out. Uh, while you know, there's this idea of uh, signing key pair particular algorithm type and key size, all the concepts that you'd actually see in the JCA declaration are captured. Uh, there is no idea of assigning key pair in the JCA, so the Kotlin API actually distinguishes between uh, keys being created for signature use and keys being created for encryption. And so declaratively it will actually prevent people from accidentally using one for the other. Uh, we'll see how that actually works uh, in more detail. Uh, in a couple of slides. But yeah, this is the fairly simple example of what creating a key pair looks like. So here's where it gets a bit more interesting. Um, this is how we generate a PKCS10 certification request. Now, KP is actually uh, what we generated on the previous slide. That's our signing key. And as it's a signing key, you can see that we have uh, a verification key, which is the public key. And then there's KP.signing key, which is the um, uh, private key. And in this case, our signature is, again, defined in a, a declarative sense. And it's PKCS. Uh, 1v1.5 with SHA-256 as a message digest. Now, one of the interesting features of this, of course, is that um, because the uh, algorithm name for the signature algorithm and also the message digest it's using are actually real live, uh, what you'd call um, Kotlin things, it's actually possible to uh, construct uh, your own version of the API and prevent people from using particular algorithms or whatever by simply leaving out the declarations. So yeah, as an example, um, if the Kotlin API, somebody wanted to avoid people using SHA-256, they could simply remove the definition of it from the uh, DSL uh, description. Uh, if they've done that, then uh, the uh, script uh, won't even compile, let alone run. So, uh, unlike with the JCA where, you know, everything's defined by strings, so it's always a bit hard to tell what's real and what isn't. Uh, in this particular case, because everything is typed, uh, you can automatically tell if something shouldn't be there because things will actually refuse to work. Now, the other thing I should point out too is that, uh, as you can see, we've specified some overrides for um, the output stream writer. And so, yeah, all you have to do to generate a PKSS10 file and write it to standard out in PEM format is basically just call the right PEM object. And this also applies for things like private keys, encrypted private keys, and things like that as well. Uh, again, as, as I said, the, the emphasis is really on just trying to provide a uh, uh, tools to allow someone who's not really uh, into the idea of writing a long program to do something to just write a short script 
and produce a, a key pair of certification request or, or even, as you'll see a bit later, a certificate. So here's an example for actually generating a, uh, a certificate. Uh, we've got another signing key pair, which we built here. Uh, again, our parameter type is passed in a in a declarative sense. So in this case, we're creating a uh, an elliptic curve key pair for the curve P two five six. The certificate generation looks very much like the PKCS ten. Uh, certification request did before. Basically you just assign the fields to what you want and, and off it goes. Uh, again as you can see the uh, signature declaration includes ECDSA with SHA-256 and that's done in, in that sort of declarative style where they're, they're actual Kotlin uh, objects that are actually used to determine what algorithm are used. So you can probably remember that uh, in the case of the Java APIs, there's a uh, distinction between a version 1 and a version 3 certificate by the type of the constructor that's used. In the Kotlin API, uh, whether or not a certificate is a version 3 or version 1, one is simply uh, determined by the presence of uh, the extension stanza. So if you have an extensions block declared inside your uh, certificate declaration, then that certificate is automatically included. It, it, it is automatically assumed that that certificate is a version 3 one, uh, largely because it has to be. Um, now, an extension stanza itself is just composed of objects defined in extension stanzas. There's a generic one of these to allow people to define proprietary extensions or, or ones that we haven't actually gotten around to including. But we do also include some of the specialized ones such as subject key identifier extension and authority key identifier extension to make it easier for people to actually construct them without having any issues. Uh, introducing this into the actual certificate declaration is as complicated as just assigning the extensions field uh, inside the body of the certificate object. Uh, you'll see some examples of um, how to make use of the extension stanza in uh, in the handouts. Now, outputting private keys, as as with uh, certificates and certification requests, um, you can write a private key out, obviously, as a as a PEM file. And uh, as I've already mentioned, you know we provided overrides, we provided an override which is just a write PEM object method to the output stream writer. So if you simply want to write one out uh, to system out for example, you just basically do it by calling write PEM object and passing the key you want. You can also save private keys those encrypted private key structures using either a straight key wrapping key or a PBE algorithm. So for private key encryption, the Kotlin API actually offers two PBE algorithms. Uh, both of these are FIPS compliant. One is PBKDF2 and the second one is the memory hard algorithm Scrypt. Uh, the reason Scrypt is uh, FIPS compliant is it is in fact just an augmentation of the PBKDF2 algorithm. Uh, PBKDF2 is the algorithm that was originally defined in uh, the RSA standard PKCS5, it's also known as PKCS5 Scheme 2. Scrypt uses this internally to actually process the password and then applies a uh, mixing function using Salsa20 to actually add the memory hardness component. Now, the encryption stands are in this uh, declaration to produce the encrypted private key, obviously defines the, the algorithm that's in use. In this case, we've got AWS KWP uh, using Scrypt, obviously for key generation. So we can tell a couple of things from looking at this immediately. AES KWP is of course the AES key wrapping uh, algorithm, uh, the padded version, and the key size is uh, 256. So we're obviously using a 256-bit AES key wrapping padded version. And then this algorithm will actually use Scrypt 
Uh, now, there's a number of other parameters that you need to define for script, as you probably know, uh, such as the parallelization, uh, the block size, and the cost parameter. Uh, where these aren't defined, the uh, script basically just uses the definitions that were recommended in RFC 7914, uh, the original um, RFC that actually describes the script algorithm. Uh, as you can see, the only other thing, of course, that we need to be able to do is say what private key uh, we're trying to encrypt, and that's done by assignment. So again, the uh, API is trying to maintain that uh, sort of declarative style you know, so that the people, when they're reading it, just think, oh, I, I'm just defining what I need to have done, and it will happen as if by magic, which is, the, I think, in some ways, the essence of a good scripting API. So here's an example for uh, how you use PBKDF2. And, and again, you know, this very much looks like what you'd see. Um, if you've got the memory uh, to do it and there's no other compelling issues, I definitely lean towards using Scrypt these days. Uh, the issue with PBKDF2, uh, while it's clearly FIPS compliant, you wouldn't say it was insecure, it, it does only rely on the hashing algorithm. And the issue we're starting to face now is that uh, former Bitcoin hardware GPUs, which have been um, rewired to compute large numbers of hashes really, really fast, make the choice of the iteration count in PBKDF2 uh, less and less relevant. Um, Introducing some level of memory hardness, I think, now is a really good idea if you're trying to encrypt stuff and keep it secret using a PVE-based algorithm. So, having looked at encrypting private keys in uh, Kotlin, we thought we'd actually have a look at uh, how to do the equivalent thing in Java. Uh, Partly for uh, completeness, just so you're across both of them, but also because it, it is another useful example of just, you know, how different the two APIs are in terms of how they function and what you need to do. Now, when we were in session one and looking at uh, the PKCS10 certification request, you probably would have noticed in the org.bouncercast.pkcs package there was also a PKCS8 encrypted private key info builder class. And this is actually the uh, core class which is used under the hood in uh, the Kotlin API for actually constructing uh, the private key encryptions. Now the other class that features here is the JCPKCS PBE output encrypted builder which is the one that actually manages the encryption. And that's the one which uh, gets told to either use something like uh, Scrypt or uh, PVKDF2. Now, the PKCS builder can take a copy of the private keys encoding as its constructor argument. Alternately, um, there's a JCA ver variant which will actually accept a JCA private key directly. I mean, it simply passes the um, encoding of the JCA private key back up to its parent. The encrypted builder, as I mentioned, takes the configuration and the algorithm to use for encrypting the private key. So, for example, with Scrypt, uh, the configuration you'd want to use is this one. It's the standard one. It's basically the same as what we were seeing before in the uh, Kotlin API when the private key was being encrypted using Scrypt. Having defined uh, an Scrypt config, here's what's actually required to output a private key encrypted using Scrypt, uh, using the Java API. Uh, it does look a little bit jumbled up on the slide. Uh, you'll see there aren't actually that many statements, but uh, it's obvious that the Kotlin style would probably be regarded as uh, easier to understand, especially if you weren't someone who's used to reading Java programs. Uh, I'll just break the steps up though for you. So, first thing of course we're doing is recreating the JCA Peaky CS8 encrypted private key info builder. We're uh, passing that a JCA private key. Um, then we're actually uh, 
using the uh, builder to construct a PKSS8 encrypted private key info uh, object, which we've encrypted using our scrypt config. Uh, we've specified uh, IDAS 256 rep pad as the order of the algorithm to use, which basically maps to ASKWP that was used in the uh, original uh, Kotlin script. Um, we specified our provider as BC, and then we're uh, again using the word test as our uh, password. Uh, the next step, of course, since we can't actually automatically extend output stream writer in this case, is that we're building a uh, JC pen writer object and passing the system out, and then we're calling pwwrite pwwrite close to actually output the uh, pen encoded object to stand it out in the same way that we did when we were actually dealing with the Kotlin script. Uh, as I said, you know, you can see the difference. Uh, for for non-programmers, the Kotlin's, or people that aren't really comfortable with programming, the Kotlin script is definitely much easier to cope with. So finally, uh, having gotten to the end of this, our last thing, of course, is uh, we were just going to talk a bit about key stores. So I'll use the last few minutes of uh, this session to do that. Uh, the reality is in Java, like we have talked about encrypting private keys by hand and storing them in PIM files, but really the best way to deal with a private key often is uh, keep it with its certificates and use a key store to do that. Now the BC APIs support three types of key stores. Uh, they actually do support a JKS key store, but it's a certificate only version. Now the reason for that is that um, it's there so you can also use it in FIPS. Uh, storing a private key in a JKS key store in FIPS is a non-starter, but if all you're doing is storing certificates in it, then that's okay. They're public keys. It's fine. Uh, PKCS12, which is RSA's Personal Information Exchange Protocol Data Unit, the PFXPDU, and is now defined in RFC 7292 as a widely used uh, key store format, particularly for individual uh, credentials. Uh, we also support that in Bouncy Castle, both in FIPS and in a regular BC. Uh, the issue in FIPS is that in approved only mode, PKCS12 is not actually an approved uh, key store type. And the reason for that is around the algorithm it uses for its PBE conversion. It doesn't use uh, PKSS5 Scheme 2 or, or any uh, derivative uh, version of it. So it actually gets ruled out because of the PVE algorithm. Uh, then there's BCFKS which is a uh, purpose-built FIPS compliant key store that we put together for some clients when we initially started the FIPS project and that can now be used with either PVKDF2 or Scrypt. Uh, and then finally, we have a FIPS key store, which uh, is, is a hybrid type. Uh, you have to specify it explicitly, though. We don't, we don't do the kind of things that they've done more recently in Java, where you can just go, PKCS12 will recognize JKS as well. Uh, it, it's better, I think, for, well, from our point of view anyway, and certainly from the FIPS situation point of view, it's better for people to be explicit about what they're actually saying. Now, the FIPS key store will actually read both BCFKS and JKS uh, files, but again, it will only read a JKS file if it's only got certificates in it. Uh, we could possibly do something similar to uh, JKS for PKS 12 and FIPS mode, but uh, all the feedback we've gone so far is that it really wouldn't be useful. Um, JKS, of course, allows you to read the CA certs file without having to change anything. That, that's generally useful. Normally when people have PKSS12 files though, they've always got uh, private keys in them. So it's necessary to actually transfer the uh, PKSS12 file to BCFKS. Uh, fortunately, it is actually possible to do that using the key tool if you look up what happens with the export command, export import. So 
that brings us to the end of session three, the last session of the workshop. Uh, we'll be following up with a bit of a summary um, a bit later, but uh, for now what I'd recommend is that, uh, again, have a look at the handouts, uh, try some of the questions and uh, see how you go. So um, the idea of this section is just to provide a, a quick summary of um, where we've been today. Uh, I think fundamentally though probably the best thing uh, if you're going to take anything away from this is to uh, try and do the rest of the exercises and maybe go through the handouts again. Uh, if you're doing this uh, at Tech Days of course please feel free to ask questions. Uh, if you're uh, doing it from home then yeah the exercises are probably your, um, your, your best approach. To actually making sure you understand what's uh, taken place. Uh, there's also some further resources which I'll mention in a minute on the final slide. So what we've covered in this workshop, as I said, is key pair generation using Bansi Castle, certificate request generation using Bansi Castle, certificate generation using Bansi Castle and EGBCA. We've done some basics on certificate extensions. Uh, we've basically used the Kotlin scripting API for all the above. And we've also used Kotlin and Java for output and encryption of private keys. And, and then I finished with just a quick discussion about key stores for FIPS and non-FIPS because often people get themselves into trouble. And as I said in, on that particular slide, the best way to actually store a private key really is in a key store. Uh, that way you keep it uh, associated with its certificate. No issues. One file, one artifact. In terms of what you should now be able to do, well, I guess it depends a bit if you've just finished the workshop on how far you got with the exercises and how much reading you managed to do. Uh, but really what you want to be doing, if, you're, if you want to feel like you've actually understood this workshop, you should practice enough to the point where you're comfortable doing the following things you should be able to determine the right key strength for the security level you need. You sh and don't forget things like random number uh, generators, so the quality of the entropy you're going to be using when you're generating keys, that's an important consideration as well. Make sure that whatever that you're using as the random number source is actually giving you what you're asking for. Accept no substitutes. Uh, you should also be able to determine what kind of certification request is appropriate for the key P you have. So the main, t main uh, takeaway there is you just think of proof of possession. What kind of proof of possession do I actually need to be using? With um, creating certification requests and certificates using the Bouncer Castle APIs for Java and Kotlin, uh, just follow the examples. Again, uh, be able to save and encrypt private keys using the Bouncer Castle APIs for Java and Kotlin. Uh, if you've got any issues with that still, then yeah, I'd recommend having another look at the examples again. And finally, you should be able to use key stores and understand the limitations in the certified environment. So there was, again, there's a couple of examples in uh, the session three handout. Uh, but yeah, the main takeaway there is just remember that if you're dealing with a FIPS or certified environment, you may find that some key stores can't be used or it's limited in terms of what can actually be stored in them. Finally, if all goes to plan, there should be more information uh, about the contents of this workshop on docprimekey.com and github.com slash primekeydevs. So that brings us to the end of the workshop. Uh, on behalf of Bastian and myself, I'd like to say thank you very much for your time and I certainly hope you got something out of this. Good luck with it all.